Okay. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Emily. Um, it is a pleasure to be here to do this presentation uh, for the Livermore Library. I grew up here in Livermore, library card. My first one was with the Livermore Library, so um, this is a very full circle moment for me, uh, being a journalist in this community and doing an event like this here in this community. Um, so let's jump right into it. a wonderful introduction of, of who I am, and so I won't you know, go into that whole paragraph and read it, but what I do want to mention about this is that whenever I do any type of presentation or workshop, I like to include an in introduction of myself, and uh, because I try to be really intentional about making sure that people know what my credentials and qualifications are to speak on a given topic. Um, and this point is relevant to you know, the rest of the discussion about media literacy, because part of the problem that we're seeing with the spread of fake news is that people aren't questioning where information is coming from and who is delivering it. Um, so myself, as a journalist and media professional, I wanna make sure people know that I am qualified to talk about what I'm talking about. Um, so that's the significance there, uh, but I will get into the presentation. So, um, with that said, we're gonna kick it off with a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so the sharing of information is you know, one of the oldest practices of all time. Uh, historically, it was done through oral storytelling and word of mouth. Um, you know, history, folklore, traditions were passed down in this way. Um, and as well as written um, in the form of inscriptions on stones, caves, and pillars. Um, but as we might you know, no, and might guess these were not the most sustainable um, ways of record keeping. Uh, someone somewhere said, "Hey, we need better forms of record keeping." And um, you know, a lot of information prior to what we have now, which is journalism and mass media, a lot of information was lost. Um, a lot of information was changed, uh, like playing a game of telephone. Everybody played that game as a kid, where you know you whisper to all your friends in a circle. And by the time it gets to the last person, whatever was originally said is completely something else. <laughs> um, and that's what was happening with, with um, you know, the tradition of oral storytelling, unfortunately. Um, 
So over time, we start to see this evolution in the way that we share information um, that is traceable, tangible, and more permanent. So um, we have the pre-industrial age, um, which is early times uh, around the 1400s. Um, in 1440, uh, German goldsmith Johannes Gutenberg uh, invented the printing press. Uh, we, most of us have learned about him in school. Um, and this invention revolutionized the production of the written word. Um, so that was a really crucial period there. Um, also during this time, we saw the first printed advertisement. Um, it was in a book called The Pies of Salisbury um, in Britain. And this was about seven years after the printing press was created. Um, and the book was a book of rules to assist clergymen in um, understanding the changing dates of Easter. And so the advertisement in this book is kind of um, regarded as uh, the beginning of print advertising. Um, and then, so after the pre-industrial age, we hit the industrial era, um, and this is where we saw the electric telegraph, the typewriter, the telephone, phonograph, and radio were invented during this time. Um, and then you have the golden age, which the, um, the industrial era and the golden age kind of into each other a little bit because um, technically, for instance, the television was created during the industrial age, but what we really started to see was that um, film and radio started to become more core mediums of entertainment and information sharing during the golden age. Um, and so this period also saw the, the launch of Time Magazine, uh, which was first published in March of 1923, and as we know, it's still, um, alive and well today. Um, and that, the Time Magazine is the first weekly news magazine in the country, in the US. So then moving forward to the electronic age, that's where we see the rise of cable television, FM radio, uh, which offered better sound quality than AM radio, cassette tapes, um, the development of email, the first mobile phone, cell phone, as we call it now, VCR, so on and so on. Um, and then we had the Columbus Dish Dispatch, uh, which was a news publication that actually became the first newspaper to technically publish online, um, even though the modern internet as we know it today didn't quite exist yet until a few years later. Um, but the Dispatch began um, transmitting news, news stories uh, using the computer dial-up service. And uh, that's how news was kind of getting into people's home computers. Um, so that's where we start to see that take place. And I will just say, uh, because I do work for Embarcadero Media, um, and our first publication is the Palo Alto Weekly. And actually, um, in January of 1994, the Palo Alto Weekly um, was the first newspaper, it became the first newspaper in the US to publish its entire editorial content on the World Wide Web, which is the internet that we're using today. So fun little company fact that we like to share about who we are. Um, but anyway, so then we move forward to the evolution, evolution of new media, which is where we are today. Uh, you know, social media, streaming, um, all of those different platforms that we're using today, uh, YouTube, so on and so forth. Um, so where we are today has brought us to a place where we are constantly inundated by information. Um, because not only can we access real news online now, uh, but also any kind of average person can record themselves making a video or a podcast or can launch a blog, et cetera, which we all know. Um, and so there kind of becomes these blurred lines between you know, the real trained journalist news and kind of this information sharing that happens between the community and the rest of the world. Um, but believe it or not, we're actually seeing history repeat itself in this digital era. And it might not seem like it because we have all this technology now that obviously you know, didn't exist in those previous eras that I mentioned before. Um, but the difference is, is that now we're kind of going back to that oral storytelling, word of mouth, um, where we're just kind of distributing information amongst each other. Even though we have this profession of journalism and we have professional trained, educated journalists to bring us the news, 
we're also still sharing more across ourselves. And our digital devices, our cell phones and our streaming platforms give us the ability to do that and to reach mass audiences. So now we're not just sharing this with our own community or our own tribe, our own families. Um, we're actually being able to reach people on a global scale. Um, and so um, what we're seeing happening with the internet and with being able to reach more people is that we've actually contributed to the rise of fake news. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we have these trained, educated journalists to bring us the news. And one thing about journalists that differs from you know, regular people using the internet is that we have a basic set of principles that guides what we do. Um, every media organization has its own you know, ethics policy that might slightly differ or has more or less um, you know, guidelines. But essentially, um, these four principles really guide most of what we do, um, which is keep truth and report it, uh, minimizing harm, acting independently, and being accountable and transparent. Um, obviously, people who are not professional journalists and every people who just have access to a smartphone or a laptop, um, they're not guided by these principles. I mean, they can choose to use these principles to guide what they do, but they can also choose not to. And as we see a lot on the internet, people often choose not to. Um, you know, and they don't have to, because the difference is, is that, you know, we as journalists, if we don't follow ethics, um, you know, we can get fired. You know, we can um, tarnish our reputations and so on and so forth. Regular people, um, you know, don't have to necessarily um, suffer those consequences. So, um, with that said, so journalists do have principles and ethics that guide us. As consumers of media, you all too have responsibility, and that responsibility is to um, not contribute to the spread of fake news um, or false information. And so um, with that comes the need to discern, uh, discern the difference between what's real and what's not um, so that you can help stop the spread. I know stop the spread, we use that so much in COVID that phrase and that was mm -hmm. here, but in a different context. Um, so these being a responsible media consumer includes stopping, uh, or well, these three, these three um, reminders, stop, reflect, and verify. So stop, when you see something, don't automatically hit the share button. Um, no matter how salacious or exciting or interesting it might seem, um, stop for a second before you hit that share. And then reflect and think about how can you stop the spread of misinformation. Think about what that post is or what that article is that you were thinking about sharing. And look into what it means, what who wrote it, what is it, um, and then verify. Verify the information in that. So when you look at the source, who, who is this? Is this a credible source? Is it a source that you've heard of before? Um, did, it, did it just come from you know, one of your Facebook friends or did it come directly from a media outlet? Um, you know, verify. And you can also, you know, if something seems legit but you're not too sure, of course, you, know, you can always go in and Google and see, okay, has another credible source that I know of, that I know about, that I'm familiar with, have they covered this information? Have they also shared this information? And if you're seeing that, you know, if you're seeing East Bay Times or Livermore Line or, um, you know, other resources sharing the information, more than likely that helps you verify whether or not um, it's accurate or true. Um, and so I also want to just kind of give a little, as we're talking about misinformation, uh, give a little definition to the difference between misinformation and disinformation. We hear both of those words sometimes used interchangeably, uh, but they are different. Misinformation is fake news that's created and spread by someone who doesn't realize that it's false. Um, we see this a lot you know, on Facebook and on social media where someone sees an article, they might not have stopped, reflected, and verified, and they just shared it thinking that they were you know, um, sharing accurate information but it actually turns out that it was not. Um, disinformation is spread by people who are deliberately, knowingly sharing uh, fake news. Um, and sometimes they can do that for you know, their own um, 
kind of selfish reasons. If they want to go viral, they want likes, they want shares, they want comments. Um, other times they can do it because they want to confuse people. Um, so, you know, this is an election season. A lot of times there are people who um, deliberately want to spread disinformation because they want to confuse voters. Um, and, you know, they want to try to influence um, the way that voters make decisions at the polls. So I wanted to get into some um, kind of examples about misinformation and disinformation and where you might see that. Uh, and so I have a, a two examples are with citizen journalism and with deep fakes. So citizen journalism is pretty commonly how we will sometimes get misinformation because people actually, you know, regular citizen journal journalism is pretty self-explanatory. It's citizens and community members um, collecting and distributing information. And a lot of times, you know, um, the intentions are pure. The intentions are good. They're citizens who just want to engage and pass along information and make something more widespread that they feel like isn't getting enough attention in mainstream media. Um, so with this example, uh, some of you may or may not know, but I just had a baby about six weeks ago. Um, and so when I was still pregnant, I was just scrolling. And again, if I'm a trained journalist, I'm also a bit of a human. So I do uh, fall into the trap of misinformation sometimes. So I'll just preface that by saying that. Um, so as I'm scrolling, I come across you know, a TikTok video where um, you know, this woman is discussing uh, a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit against Phillips Avent and Dr. Brown, which are two of the leading, uh, most popular baby bottle brands. And the lawsuit um, basically was accusing these companies of not disclosing the presence of microplastics in their products. And so I see this, I see the video, she's telling me about the lawsuit and all this, and I'm like, because I had just made my baby registry, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta go in and take all these bottles off, glass bottles only, silicone. You know, and I start, I start just getting all this in my head. And um, then, you know, like a day later, I come across another article uh, from, you know, what to expect when you're expecting. And they're like, here, and the, the headline was, um, you know, here's why you don't need to freak out about that baby bottle lawsuit. And in that article, it kind of explains um, how, yes, these companies should be transparent and absolutely should be disclosing what's in their products. However, the dangers of microplastics were being a little bit blown out of proportion because yes, they are dangerous, but also they are everywhere. <laughs> microplastics are in the air that we, that we breathe, actually. They're, they're everywhere. And so exposure to microplastics is inevitable. Your baby is going to be exposed to microplastics, <laughs> so uh, whether you use these bottles or not. And so um, that just helped me calm down a little bit. I mean, obviously, there's still concern and there's still fear over companies that don't disclose, you know, issues with their products. But it does help you not get into that hysteria, hysteria of fear, um, which a lot of times that's what we can do to each other is we can fear monger, even without trying to, without knowing that we are, um, you know, sometimes we can have that effect. Um, and so that's just one personal example from just from my own experience um, with citizen journalism. And I'm just going to take a quick pause here because um, I intended to kind of give you guys an opportunity to ask questions throughout the presentation as well as at the end. Um, so I'll take a pause here and ask if there are any questions or comments on anything I've gone over so far. Well, I kind of have more of a comment than a question. I have a friend that I've known for 30 years that is a member of an opposite political party than me. And sometimes I hear things from her and I have to question that because we watch different news stations, we read different newspapers, and I will ask her, did you hear that or do you know that? And I think that things that you hear on the news I believe what I hear, and she believes what she hears. So we have to know which is true and which is correct. And that's the thing about hearing something and knowing. And it's impossible to tell sometimes. Yeah, that's an important point. And actually, um, it's, I'll dive into this a little bit more in, in part two, but I do want to touch on, just because you mentioned it, that having those kind of um, 
friends that are on opposite sides of the spectrum or might um, might be exposed to different media than you are is important because you want to because how the internet works and how Google works and everything is you know the algorithm which we hear about which you know it essentially um, learns you it learns what you like what you want to hear what you want to know and that's what it shows you all the time that's what it's it's putting out there for you to see and so it's very easy to kind of get into this place where you're only seeing what you already agree with and what you already feel like you know is true. Um, and so anything outside of that doesn't really get pushed to you. And so, um, you know, making sure, being intentional about kind of diversifying the media that you consume is very important. Um, and, you know, you and that friend can kind of have conversations where you say, you know, well, you know, I saw on CNN this, and she says, well, I saw on Fox this, and you can have those conversations and, you know, do that research together. Um, and, and even individuals, without talking to another person, you can do that on your own. If you are seeing, you know, your Google updates are showing you specific articles, you can go out of your way to go search past the, past for Google's first page and dig a little deeper to find articles that might differ from the ones that, you know, your algorithm wants to show you. Um, so that's, a, so that's really an important um, so another, just going back into, uh, miss, did I miss a question? Okay. Um, I was, I was pretty involved with NGOs, communications for a while back, and I'm not there anymore, but what, what I did learn was that if the picture of somebody or an article about somebody that is controversial, but you don't support comes up, do not click on it because you will get more and more of that. And it will, uh, it's called clickbait. You will see it and it will happen all over the place for you, but it will also um, sort of multiply on the internet. Um, so I, I try, it's not easy, but I do try to click on things that um, I'm interested in. Absolutely, and that is important too. And and I and I guess I should clarify too what I what I mean by diversifying the media you consume and kind of um, looking for other media that differs from what you believe to be true. That still needs to be credible, right? Because you know certain news outlets we know might take a more liberal stance, or others might take a more conservative stance. But that that doesn't mean they're they're not credible necessarily. Um, but it's important to kind of see both so that you kind of see you, you have an understanding, you have a clear understanding of what this side is saying versus what this side is saying. But it still needs to be a credible source. So if you are seeing something like clickbait, like um, what Mary is saying, it's a very salacious headline or it's something that you know, oh, this, this can't be real, you know. It is a good idea to probably avoid clicking on that for sure. Um, and well, I, I see a certain person's picture and face on all over the place and it's, there may, may be articles attached to that and I, may read the article, but I wouldn't be liking it yes, at exactly. all. Yes, exactly. And that's important too. That's another form of engagement where you can click on the link and you can read the article, but if you don't engage with it as far as liking, commenting, and sharing, then um, that also, you know, if you engage with it more, it's gonna show you it more, kind of like what Mary was describing. But if you only, you know, just engage with it by just clicking the link, you, you scanned it or you read it or whatever, you might see something similar again, but it's, it's not going to pop up as much as it would if you engage with it more. Because the more you engage with it, the more the algorithm thinks you like it and want to see it. Um, so that is an excellent point. Um, and it, it's also a great segue what you're saying about seeing someone's face plastered and you know information not being real about them going into deep fakes. Um, has anyone here heard of what deep fakes are? Okay, yes. Um, so essentially, you know, um, they are images, videos, any type of audio that's edited um, or generated using AI, um, and they could depict real or non-existent people. In this case, this um, this is a screenshot of a Kamala Harris deepfake, and I will show you the actual video. Um, I, Kamala Harris, am your Democrat candidate for president because Joe Biden finally exposed the civility of the debate. I was selected because I am the ultimate diversity hire. I'm both a woman and a person of color. So if you criticize anything I say, you're both sexist and racist. 
I may not know the first thing about running the country, but remember, that's a good thing if you're a deep state puppet. I had four years under the tutelage of the ultimate deep state puppet, a wonderful mentor, Joe Biden. Joe taught me rule number one, carefully hide the total of confidence. I take in significant things and I discuss them as if they're significant. And I believe that exploring the significance of the insignificant is in itself significant. Talking about the significance of the passage of time, right? The significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time. And there is such great significance to the passage of time. Another trick is trying to sound well. I pretend to celebrate Kwanzaa. And in my speeches, I always do my best Barack Obama impression. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. And okay, look, maybe my work addressing the root causes of the border crisis were catastrophic, but my knowledge of international politics is truly shocking. The United States shares a very important relationship, which is an alliance with the Republic of North Korea. It is an alliance that is strong and enduring. And just remember, when voting this November, it is important to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And by what has been, I mean, Joe Biden. Do you think the country went to sh over the past four years? You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> so that's crazy. So we know that, uh, hopefully you know that um, that's not a real ad for the Kamala Harris campaign. Uh, it is a deep fake. It's been distorted, but it does use real clips um, of Vice President Harris, and it uses her voice. And um, again, the importance of media literacy is someone could very well see that video and believe it to be real and believe it to be true. And even though the person who actually tweeted it, uh, this Twitter user known as Mr. Reagan, they put in the caption that it is a parody, um, but if someone's sharing that video and they're not including that disclaimer, or even if they read even if they watch the video without even reading the caption, which a lot of people do, they just click on the, uh, the media without reading the caption, they can very well believe this to be real and be true. And that's kind of the danger of deep fakes in general, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you are on, is that um, it can lead to misinformation and disinformation because the people who create these deep fakes, they are knowing that it's not real, they are knowing that it's not true, and oftentimes they don't include disclaimers that it's fake and it's a parody. They just put it online for people to discern or interpret on their own, um, you know, which can be very dangerous. And so in this case, this, this video actually made national headlines because Elon Musk shared it. Um, and when he shared the video, he did not include the disclaimer that it was a parody. And you know, a lot of us, like we just did, we can watch it and discern on our own that, okay, this is obviously fake, and maybe that's what Musk thought that people would do. But it doesn't matter, because with a platform as big as Musk's, um, you know, it's, it's his responsibility, as all public figures' responsibility who are sharing things like this, to make sure that they're following, understands, and knows whether or not the content they're sharing is real or false, especially because the platform that it was shared on is the one that he owns. <laughs> Formerly known as Twitter, um, and so this, you know, he got called out. Elon Musk got called out by Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Governor Gavin Newsom, a lot of different political fi figureheads um, for sharing this video without the context that it was a parody. Um, and so eventually, um, you know, Musk did come out and, and, you know, explain that it was a parody and, and clarified that um, he shared it as satire. But by that time, who knows how many people had already seen it and believed it to be and then shared it to their friends, believing it to be true, and so on and so on. So, you know, at that point, the damage is, is kind of done at that point. Um, so um, another issue that kind of came about from this, this situation is understanding, you know, every social media platform does have policies and terms and conditions, and we don't always read all those, right? We just click accept and, you know, go on about our business. Um, but it is important to understand because, you know, a lot of the platforms have policies related to uh, this type of media. In this case, on X, um, there is called the synthetic manipulated or out of context, um, I'm sorry, the policy is called synthetic and manipulated media policy. Um, and what it says, the actual policy says that users may not share synthetic, manipulated, or out of context media 
that may deceive or confuse people and lead to harm. And so the policy does have an exception for memes and satire, um, as long as they don't cause significant confusion about the authenticity of the media. Well, clearly sharing a video like this without any context that it's a parody or a deep fake, um, you know, you would think that that would cause confusion about the authenticity of the media. Okay. Are there standards determining or defining what that authenticity is? And I'm sure there are, but that's part of the, that's part of what people are trying to understand and what people are trying to figure out, uh, because you could. I mean, I, I suppose there's an argument even saying, well, it uses real clips of Vice President Harris, right? So, you know, I mean, it, there, there's arguments to everything, and I think that's part of the issue that we're seeing um, is right now, um, government is trying to understand how to, beg, how to better put up guardrails and regulation for AI and for social media because we don't fully understand those things yet and what those standards are and what we can say is satire and what's not. And you know, in this case, I'm sure, you know, like I said, this what I just read was X's policy. Elon Musk owns X. Did he violate his own policy? I'm sure he would say not, because I'm sure he would have an argument to say that, oh, this is clearly satire, this is clearly, and that's that's allowed under the policy. But you know, there there's there's different arguments to be made on either spectrum. And so that's why I think we we we're finding ourselves in a in a troubled time right now where we're trying to figure out how do we do this better. <laughs> Um, and how do we make it more clear, not only for users, but for the people creating these platforms, and also for um, uh, uh, media professionals like journalists, and, and how we can use these platforms to leverage the real news that we're sharing without getting washed up in whatever fake stuff is out there. Um, and I, I, I will just note too that, um, you know, Elon Musk also found himself in hot water with Brazil, and um, uh, so apparently he refused to comply with court orders to suspend certain accounts as Brazil is trying to work on cleaning up hate speech and things like that on social media. And um, um, you know, Musk said, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do it essentially. And Brazil said, okay, then we're gonna ban X. And so right now um, X is banned in Brazil and former X users are now migrating to different platforms like Threads and a Twitter offshoot called Blue Scheme. Um, and so that's, you know, they received some kind of mixed reviews, I think, from the actual citizens of Brazil because some people see it as, um, you know, the government deciding to ban the platform as kind of suppressing free, free speech, uh, but other people feel like it's, it's protecting uh, the citizens of Brazil from the harm that exists on this platform. So there are different opinions on that, but I did just want to call that out too because we're seeing that these issues are not just here, they're abroad, it's makes global impact and that's important too because we need to understand how this kind of impacts us as a people, not just um, as a country. Um, okay, and uh, I have the remote, I keep telling you to change slides and I can do it myself. Okay, um, <laughs> another example on citizen journalism that I did wanna call out. Um, earlier when I shared those basic principles of, um, that, that, are, that guide journalists and media professionals, um, one of those principles is minimizing harm. And so um, I think this is an important example to share because um, even though information can be true or can be accurate, um, you have to discern and recognize whether or not harm can still be caused by it. And so in, in our case, and I'll explain more about what's happened with this situation, but just in our case with my job, you know, a lot of times things will happen, you know, to young people or to youth. Um, or you know, vulnerable communities. And we have to decide whether or not we are gonna cover that because we have to decide whether our coverage of it is going to cause more harm. You know, we might feel like people need to know, community needs to know, but will us putting a story out about this end up causing more harm? Or how can we put the information out because people wanna know and minimize the impact and minimize the harm? And so in a lot of cases, for instance, you know, we choose not to uh, publish someone's name. You know, in a crime story, if someone hasn't been um, actually charged with a certain crime, um, but they were just arrested for that crime, we, will we might publish a story about the arrest um, and what they're accused of, but we won't necessarily put their name. Um, so that's just an example of how you kind of um, can discern and decide from a 
journalist perspective, how to minimize harm. Now again, with citizen journalists, because we are just regular people, um, a lot of times we don't have that, um, you don't have that discernment, you don't have an editor to kind of tell you, oh, maybe you should consider this, maybe you should consider that. You're just kind of acting on impulse a lot of times. So with this example, um, you know, Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, along with um, a few other, um, I think there were seven people total, um, died in a plane crash in January of 2020. They were headed to a youth basketball game. Um, and when the crash happened, first responders uh, who showed up ended up using their personal cell phones to take photos of the wreckage and take photos of the bodies. And uh, there was no, um, I'll preface it by saying that sometimes there is um, a credible reason for a first responder to take pictures at the scene of something like that. Uh, but in this case, there was not. Um, they just took them on their personal devices and then shared them like with their spouses, friends. Um, I think one of the um, first responders shared it with people at a bar. Um, just kind of as souvenirs of the incident. Because of course Kobe Bryant is a major big public figure and you know this, this was major big news. Um, well, spreading those pictures around, that causes harm to the surviving loved ones of all the people who are still grieving and mourning their loss from that crash. And so there was a lawsuit. Vanessa Bryant, Kobe Bryant's wife, um, she filed um, a lawsuit along with her co-defendants were other families, surviving families of people who died in the crash. And in total, her settlement along with the other family settlement uh, came out to $51 million uh, that the county of Los Angeles had to, um, had to pay up, had to cough up. Um, and so that's an example where, yes, the photos that were shared, they were real, they were accurate. They were actually pictures of the wreckage in the crash. And you know those those first responders probably didn't think they were causing harm because they didn't blast them on the internet, they didn't sell them to TMZ, they just showed them to close friends and family. But that still gets around, that still spreads. We all talk. If you, any of us, I'm sure, even myself as a journalist, if I saw a picture of that wreckage, I would have told someone. I would have told my husband. My husband probably would have told his friend. You know, so we just um, have to be mindful of that sort of thing. And that is not what happened in this case. And the result was, you know, a big. Uh, a big uh, financial burden on the county of uh, Los Angeles. Um, now, while we're kind of talking about the harms of citizen journalism, and, and I'm spending a lot of time on this here because, um, you know, as, as we are all members of our own community, and as this is an election season, and we're all sharing information, we're all reading information, we're all engaging in conversations um, about voting and about the election, we, we all, at one time or another, have been citizen journalists. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but we want to make sure that what we are doing and what we are sharing, we're being intentional about it, and we are um, not contributing to the spread of misinformation or disinformation. And so, oh, did you? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I just was gonna ask, um, because I think this is a great, and you had mentioned like some of the standards of like how you as a trained journalist um, decide not to name a source. It, are these are the standards usually available to the readers to see as a signal like, okay, this source is following ethics. Yeah. Whereas, you know, somebody who's a, cin a citizen journalist who just posts on Facebook or Instagram will not have those uh, standards. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And yes, most um, you know credible media outlets we have access to our ethics policies on our websites. So if you go, you know, usually you know you see like an about us or about this publication or whatever. And you know if you go in there, usually you will find the publication's ethics policy. As I mentioned earlier, every media outlet kind of has its own specific policy. Those were kind of just some basic guiding principles. And so you might see some different differences between each media outlet. Um, but yes, so it is accessible to readers and to the public to see what policies a given um, media outlet is following. And if you aren't able to find that on their website somewhere, then that should be a red flag right there that you might want to question the veracity of that publication and what they're, what they're publishing. Great question. Um, 
So as I was saying, I, I did just want to share a positive example of citizen journalism as, as we're just kind of talking about some of the more harmful examples. Um, in this case, um, everybody remembers the miracle on the Hudson when Captain Sully landed the plane on the Hudson River. And I'm sure all of you have seen this picture somewhere uh, because this was one of the very first pictures um, of, the, of the landing and it went super, super viral. Even in 2009, before we had as many social media outlets as we do now. Um, and so the photo was taken by um, a man named Janice Crumbs, who was, I think, about 23 at the time. And he was on a ferry that was going to rescue folks, um, passengers on the plane. And you know, he took out his iPhone and, and just snapped a picture. He had 170 followers on Twitter at the time, which is not a lot. And he only shared the picture to that 170 followers. But it exploded. It went everywhere um, at the time. So the technology at that time where um, you couldn't just upload a picture directly to Twitter, you used another app called TwitKick, and then you put the picture there, and then you're able to tweet the picture out after that. And so he actually uploaded the picture to TwitKick, put it on Twitter, and it went so viral that it actually uh, broke the TwitKick servers um, because it was just being shared so widely. And the media outlets were contacting Janice and being like, can't we use your photo? Um, and you know, he, he allowed um, media outlets to use it, which is why we can see it here. This was a, this is a screenshot from CNN, uh, but it went everywhere. So, uh, and the LA Times deemed this, uh, deemed the photo um, among the most striking instances of instant citizen reporting of, of that time. And it was, uh, because media outlets could not get out there fast enough to capture this image. And so the fact that someone who was there on the ground was able to do that, and we're able to have this image in, in history, this is a historical image at this point, um, is, is very important. It was a vital, important means of reporting on what happened that day on the Hudson River. Um, so I did just wanna, I did wanna give that. <laughs> um, and, and also just, as I said earlier, this makes global impact, right? Because once people see that this is something that you can do and this is the impact that you can make, more and more people are wanting to do that, more and more, for different reasons, right? There are people who wanna do it because they just wanna share the information, they want people to have it. But then, as I mentioned earlier, there's also people who just want likes, clicks, and they wanna go viral, and they wanna, well, Ellen's not on anymore, but get on Ellen and things like that, Jimmy Kimmel, whatever else. Um, you know, they want notoriety. And um, again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about discernment, is just kind of understanding and, and checking um, uh, what the intentions might be of the person or the outlet that is sharing a given, a given material. Um, I'll just pause here quickly again, ask if there's any other questions or, or comments about anything so far. Okay. okay. I don't have any questions about the material you shared so far, well, maybe one. Sure. Um, what was, I'm old, so I'm forgetting the title of the section where um, Kamala Harris was spouting a lot of things that she would never spout. Um, has that, and it was AI, um, has that ever been done to Donald Trump? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually, and I mentioned Elon Musk shared the video. It's been done to him too. <laughs> you know, he, he's been generated as saying things that he has not said. It's pretty much any public figure you can think of. There's either some type of audio or video, or even just a still photo of them where they were like, I was never at that place. How did that, why does it look like I'm there? So, yes. I, I was just going to comment. So, it is, it's called deep fake. Is that deep fake? That's phrase. Mm -hmm. But have you heard of the liar's dividend? So as a result of um, deep fakes, uh, bad actors are then able, their, their liar's dividend has expanded. So they have a lot more space to be like, I never did that, which they could have done. So there could be record, somebody caught on a hot mic or caught on camera. I'll just let you guys think of different instances in time where public figures or politicians have been caught doing something wrong, now the liar's dividend has expanded so they can say that wasn't me. That is true, yeah, that is a great point. Very true, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that happen too. Um, you don't believe that's really me, right? Um, yes, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because that does happen too and then at that point it's kind of, but then a lot of times too we'll have you know some 
some witness accounts and things where you know we can prove whether or not you know this was real or not in some ways. But but again, what is proof, right? Because some people might think just that video alone is proof that Kamala Harris said X, Y, and Z. Um, so again, it, it's just it's all um, a difficult time right now. And as I mentioned, you know this is um, you know legislators are trying to figure out how we can put up better guardrails to. Um, kind of like narrow this, this issue that we're facing. But the problem is, is that the internet is just moving too fast. People are moving too fast. Um, and there's, every time you feel like you got a handle on one piece, something else comes out or something else is, you know, another platform is out or something. And there's just more and more ways to get um, false information out there. So um, the most we can do for ourselves really is be media literate, which is, which is what we're all trying to do. And as I mentioned earlier, even I, you know, fall, have fallen victim to just kind of, you know, getting into the hysteria of information that's put in front of me, even before I've checked the veracity. And so we're all human. We all see something that appeals to us, and we might get caught up in it. Um, but going back to stop, reflect, and verify, you know, if we keep that in the back of our minds, we can take the time that we need to. Okay, like that that baby bottle video that I saw on TikTok. Even though I saw it, I didn't share it. I didn't go. Oh my gosh, pregnant people and moms, look at this video. I didn't do that, even though I got scared for myself. I was like, let me chill out, <laughs> you know, like let me let me not just, you know. And so um, those are ways that we as individuals can kind of, you know, help to to not be part of the problem, but be more part of the solution, uh, which segues into the slide that I have up on the screen, uh, which is how to counter the spread of myths and misinformation in your own communities. Um, these are some tips that we're actually we're actually um, derived from a, a, a government youth program um, to help understand media literacy. Uh, but I, I think it's great for everybody, not just for you. So um, I've kind of tweaked it a little bit and, and kind of uh, put my own spin on it, but that's where these tips kind of originated. Um, so examining article headlines, which we talked a little bit about, you know, if you see something that is very salacious or that might be clickbait, um, you can kind of tell by the headline itself uh, whether that might be questionable. Um, and like I said before too, um, checking other sources that you do know to be credible and see how they are reporting on the issue um, could also help you determine um, whether or not a headline was more just meant to catch you and make you click or whether it was really meant to tell you the what's going on in the story. Um, checking numbers of likes and comments on a post, um, we talked a little bit about this earlier too, as far as engagement and how much people engage on a post. Um, a lot of times we'll see on social media there are um, you know, fake profiles that people create uh, to seem like they are uh, a public figure of some kind, whether that's a celebrity or whether that's a politician or what have you. There's fake profiles. And on X, actually, because there used to be um, on every platform you know, uh, a real public figure can be verified. And you know, seeing that little blue check would let you pretty much know that they were a real person, um, or they were really who they said they were. And X got rid of all the blue checks, and you have to pay for it now. But anyone can pay for one. So now it's not as um, now it's not as a it's not as a clear cut way to determine who is who because now it's kind of open season on the blue check. Um, but looking at the number of likes and comments on a post. You know, a certain public figure or politician that you would expect to have, you know, probably thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers, and you see a page that looks like it's them, and they only have maybe, you know, 300 or 500 followers, probably not their real page. Um, if, if you're looking at their posts and, you know, their posts don't seem, you know, curated or they don't seem, you know, the, the captions, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of typos, you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, weird phrasing or wording probably not the actual person. Because most of these folks, you know, politicians and celebrities alike, will have a um, social media team or an assistant or an intern or somebody who is helping them curate their social media platforms. And so if it looks a little bit too normal, <laughs> um, <laughs> then it's probably not uh, the actual person. Um, and then, you know, if they only have a certain small number of followers, they're not gonna have as many likes, comments, or engagement on their posts. Um, so those are kind of you know ways that you can check. Um, taking a post, um, as I mentioned, accounts posing as other people that kind of falls in line with that. Um, and so 
um, I'll skip down to recording suspicious content. Um, most social media platforms have a way where if you see a certain post, you can choose to hide it. And if you hide it, then a, a box will pop up that will ask, okay, why do you want to hide this? Is it false? Is it, is it harmful? Is it this or is it that? And you can check whichever one, or you can just say, I just don't like it, I don't want to see it. And that's fine too. Um, but that's a way that you can report suspicious content. Um, you know, you can also just simply, you know, take a screenshot or link to it. And um, most platforms have like a customer service type of account um, or page that you can submit suspicious content to. Uh, that's another way. And then also promoting credible sources, sources that you trust and uh, feel like you know to be true and accurate sources. Share those, Sh share your content from those. Look at what they're publishing on a certain topic and um, promote those sources heavily, like LizaMarine.com. Um, <laughs> Oh, and also ask where the information came from when it's shared with you. I believe you had mentioned earlier about your friend where when you hear something from her and you say, do you know that or did you hear that? That's, that's great because you're already using that discernment to kind of determine if what, what the information that's being delivered to you is, is credible and it's accurate. And that's something we all really need to do. If somebody just says, okay, I heard or hey, I saw on social media or I read this article, where? Where did the article come from? Where did you see it on social media? Who told it to you? Um, you know, trace, trace the steps of the information. Uh, and then lastly, of course, educating friends, family, and community. Um, you know, taking what you learned from today, hopefully you learned something, if you learned anything, um, hopefully you can take that back to your friends, family, and other communities and help educate them, um, bring them up to speed. Um, and then things that you know personally that you've learned or that you've researched or whatever that you feel like um, will help counter the spread of mis and disinformation, share that. Don't just feel like, you know, you might have a conversation with somebody who might have different views than you and you might feel like, oh, nothing I say, they're gonna continue to just spout, you know, false information or whatever. It doesn't mean it's not still worth saying or still worth educating on where they can maybe find some more accurate information if what you know of what they're saying is, is not true or not credible. Um, any questions about any of that? Just a comment that I just really appreciate hearing that from journalists and I try to take it to heart because I know I try to avoid those interact interactions a lot, especially with family, because I don't, it's like, you know, I don't want to go there, but um, I, I think it's so good to challenge ourselves just to like speak up for truth. We say that all the time. Um, and so it's something that I hear a lot from journalists and I think we should be allies of it's hard to do. It is. Because I don't think you could change my mind today on who I'm going I'm going to opt to vote for. You can tell me things and I can tell you my opinion. But I I try to if I'm going to speak to someone and tell them my thoughts, then I want to be able to listen to their thoughts and sometimes I'm not being open either. So it's a two way street. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's important too because, you know, while I'm saying it's, it's still worth, you know, speaking the truth and speaking up for truth, like Emily said, there, there is a point where you can just be wasting your breath and, you know, you realize you've said it, the person doesn't want to receive it. And that's that. You don't necessarily have to keep pushing it or, you know, they you might decide that this is exhausting me and I just to walk away from this and that's totally okay too but you know you still you still put it out there and whether or not that other person wants to receive it is up to them so it definitely is a two-way street but um it's, it's worth doing but i'm also biased because i'm a journalist i, I still have <laughs> my time with reading the truth um there have been canvassings in the last several years and in the process of doing that i have learned that what you do is you find out you try to tune into some people's ideas and values and then pick out whatever you can um, connect to and find find what's in common. And you may not end up with an outcome that you want, but it's still a human connection and it's useful. That's great. Thank you for that. That is true. That's a great, great strategy to use when talking to someone. I, I have a question about 
that the vehicles have come under fire in San Francisco for keeping residents awake at night. Is it true? Okay, one person says, yes, it is true. Is there anybody who thinks it's not true? Two people say it's true. I think it's true. I think it's true. Okay. Thank so you. I read about this in the Chronicle. Oh, well, okay. don't, don't say, <laughs> well, why would you, not <laughs> gonna say, <laughs> now why would you, the Chronicle is a credible source, so now, <laughs> now we know the truth. But let's, let's go ahead and reveal, um, it is real. real. Yes, yeah. it is real. Yes. Um, what kind of noise? Honking. Honking, honking, honking at each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was yeah. picturing them being super quiet because, like, EVs. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But I guess when they're in parking lots. They're in an apartment building, and they're, mo they're moving throughout the night for whatever reason, and that's the mood they're honking in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So just, like, really... Bad. Is that like what you, I'm serious now, is that like what you would do if you saw a friend down the road and you talk, like, hello? It's a, it's a warning to the car you're getting close. Yeah. It sounds like animals. Well, we do that to all vehicles, then, correct? Well, this is Order. a bunch of self-driving cars are parked on a rooftop, sandwiched between apartment buildings in New York City, and they're moving around at night and honking. And so if you live in that apartment building and your windows are open, it's honk, honk, honk. But wouldn't they be doing that all day if they're on the road near a car? I guess it matters a lot more at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're trying to sleep. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine a self-driving car honking on a road because there's other cars there. Yeah. Maybe because they're reversing. Or, yeah. Or it's just like, you yeah, need to read reverse. the Chronicle article. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they do that. Yeah, so yeah. I just heard it was a big problem. I yeah. told my and neighbor, I said, your car so makes the weirdest the noise, problem. and he said it's because it's electric, and it has to make a noise when you're backed up. Yeah. Yes, and that's even like, you know, like I have a modern, a more modern car, it's 2022, and you know, if I'm reversing or it's yelling at me all the time, yeah. or if I accidentally swerve, it yells at me, and yeah, yeah so it's, it's that kind of concept. Wow. Um, we can go to the next question. Okay. Okay, so Australian break dancer Ray, uh, Rochelle Dunn, or I'm sorry, Ray Dunn, uh, became a viral sensation after her performance in the 2024 Olympics, but is it true that she was chosen to compete because her husband was on the selection panel? I just want to say I don't think break dancing should be an Olympic <laughs> event. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I love break dancing. I've okay. seen it a lot. It's amazing. It should be. It is amazing. <laughs> But the question is, yeah, <laughs> was this dancer selected because her husband was on the uh, the panel? No clue. Unless they say, what do you think? Okay, we've got, point. we've got a couple of fakes. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Fake. Yes, neither she nor her husband were on the selection panel. Um, regardless of what you feel about her performance, it was legitimate. <laughs> um, so, okay, we can go to this one. All right. Figures from 2021 revealed that there are about 1.6 million twins born each year worldwide. But is it true that schools in, and I'm going to butcher this, in Verclyde, in Scotland, recently welcomed 10 sets of twins into the new school year? So I was going to say that's real. You think it's real? Anybody think it's fake? Well, I have twins. Is that unusual? 10 sets of twins. I don't even know 10 sets of twins. So if I if there were 10 sets of twins at my school, there's only 20 kids in the school district. How big is Inverclyde? Well, Scotland's tiny. Yeah. I would want to know the population. We need a statistician before we give you an answer. You guys are already on a roll with the stock of flesh and verify. Okay, um, let's say, let's. Do we get more people say it's real or fake? Well, I'm sorry. We have two truths. So two, two people saying it's yeah. true. Okay, so let's say it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yes, yes. And Inverclyde is known for having twins. I think there was one school year, yeah, where it had 19 sets of twins. Twinverclyde. Oh. Um, yeah, that's the nickname, Twinverclyde. What? Why? Is it hereditary? And then I don't know. I didn't research <laughs> Inverclyde. <laughs> but <laughs> are a sensation on social media with over 400k posts about the fast food favorite on TikTok, but is it true that a woman in the U.S. was recently found guilty of stealing $1.5 million worth of chicken wings? I actually believe that. Mary believes it. Okay, we got another true in the back. 
Anybody think it's Well, we don't know over the length of time. That's right. But I, I read about stuff, something like that. I don't know. I'm really under something. So. It's just not something I think. OK. So where do you get that value no. if it's? that it's Elon Musk that said, I'm taking away your account. Yeah, so what, it, so what it's saying is because um, Elon Musk came under fire, um, essentially the, 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 the story is that in retaliation, he suspended the UK government's um, ex account. I think that I'm going to go through. Okay. So he's capable of it. Oh, <laughs> 
All right, uh, this year's summer has been a non-starter for many parts of the UK with temps in July that were below average for the time of year. But is it true, as claimed in a Facebook post, that this is due to the Earth's tilt being off and the planet drifting away from the sun? <laughs> no, we have. I'm gonna say that. I, I've actually read something about the tilt being off, so I will say it's true. Okay, we've got one true and four false. So let's take false and see. It is fake. Okay. <laughs> now, now the Earth may or may not be tilting, but that isn't. It hasn't been correlated with the weather that the UK has been having. Happy to be alone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. And so we got we got an eight. We got them all right. So wow. That's amazing. Yeah. We're an expert in fake news. What is that thing? Uh, uh it's what somebody <laughs> wishes he could do. Is it? You know, what in England thinks that like a reward for it's celebrating our victory. <laughs> Does anyone know who Cousin It is? Oh yes, yes. yes. I think it might be Cousin It. I got the name. Okay, oh. let's see how much time do we have. Okay, we maybe we will, won't do the real Photoshop quiz. Well, you guys have already been asking a lot of questions. How do you feel? Do you want to do the other quiz or ask more questions? Sure. Sure. Um, that is a question to you as a reporter. Sure. So. Um, Apropos of the ethics and does it do harm that story? So there are often times I in my career I'm working on um, very sensitive situations that occur usually with children. And um, if there are two children involved, I'm going to be very specific so you can answer me. If there are a couple of children involved and the uh, parents of the alleged victim of bullying or what have you, goes to the media and the media what might investigate, want to know what happened. If, from my position, the work I'm in, you'd be calling me asking me for comment, right? What should I say to you to help you understand? I think I will give you what I can. There's confidentiality, there's privacy, there are laws that restrict what I can say, what you can write. But how far do I go and how best do I tell you, please, the alleged perpetrator and victim should not be in the news story. It is so fragile. How do you convey that without looking like you're hiding yeah. and making it more, because um, not all reporters necessarily are going to hear that and work with it assuming there's integrity there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that? And then I have a question on um, citizen journals, if you can. Sure. Yes. Um, I feel very targeted. Did I email you? No, no, I'm just kidding. No, no, um, <laughs> I, know, I know that everyone in this room knows what I'm, what I'm talking about, right? right. There are times that you just have to say, please, this child is so fragile. Totally. Yeah. Um, how do you do that? Absolutely. And we, we actually get that a lot specifically, um, you know, when we reach out to the school districts or in the Tri Valley or when we reach out to Los Casitas. And we, we understand, and, and in general, reporters should understand, right. that especially in cases of with youth. We already know that youth is a sensitive topic and um, we have to kind of tread lightly with the things that we report and say in regards to youth. So so that's that's just where you start off. Which is probably but, if you make it a phone call or I mean yes. it's make it look like you're hiding. Yeah, so usually yeah, so you know, whether it's an email or a phone call, there's usually what we usually get from folks on your end is either A, you will tell us the you will confirm, so most of the time we, we know what we already know, and we're just looking to you to confirm that this actually really happened, right? right. So if, so whatever happened, you would either confirm, um, yes, there was an incident of X, Y, and Z, you know, maybe the police came out or whatever the situation is. You could give us that information, but still conceal, you know, you don't give out the student's name, you don't give out the disciplinary action that was taken against whoever, uh, you know, anyone, if there was any. Um, you, you would basically just, give the very bare bones confirmation of what happened with the situation. And most of the time, like we accept that because we do understand that as, you know, with youth and, um, you know, you working for the district or whatever else, you have a responsibility and a duty to protect your students. And, you know, we have to, we have to respect that. And so nine times out of 10, you're not gonna really get a lot of pushback of people thinking that you're hiding. Um, but then there's the flip side too, where the thing about social media is, 
if the information is already out there, and we, yeah, so that's the other thing I wanted to ask about. So that, sure. I, and I understand all that you just said, and that there are times that the, the, a child is excruciatingly vulnerable, and I'm wondering how to express that and not put it in a document. But Well, you can even express it in just plain language like that, yes. but you could say, this is off the record. Yes. yes. And we have to respect that. Yeah. Well, the minute you say something's off the record, we can't say it. Yeah, typically it's a little bit of code like which in there, like, you know, discussing children yeah. online is not an appropriate way to deal with I see that all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yes. But I think we're accustomed to that, yeah. aren't we? That children's names aren't revealed. I yeah. I'm not on not on social media. I mean, well, right. well they're on social media. That's why exactly. we're citizen journals. Exactly. Because we were poking at it and maybe not offering any help. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Are you watching them push back under free speech rights? Under what? Free speech. Free speech. So I could call you as a reporter and say the coverage of X is is not accurate. I want to talk to you about, and you're going to work to correct it. You're yes. going to recalibrate. Yes. And, and if that's not happening on the reporter, you go to the editorial board, yes. and the editorial board's going to work with you. There's, um, there's some Checks process and balances there, and, process. and there's some integrity. Yes. So the citizen journalist, when you're calling and saying, would you please, you know, like, you can rip the superintendent apart, but could you at least stick to the facts, and then they'll play with my free speech rights, because they're blending their opinion and how they're covering it. Are you seeing that emerge more with citizen journalists at all Absolutely. your observation? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why, so I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with the Moran and Mace. And, you know, Pleasanton has one, you know, every city pretty much has their own Moran and Mace Facebook group, uh, for those on video, these are Facebook community groups. Um, and that is, those places, those spaces are where we see a lot of that happen. And so it can kind of be, from a journalist's perspective, it can be kind of a catch-22 because we actually like to um, go into those spaces because we get sometimes new tips or we get you know things that we didn't know happened in the community. Oh, a fire happened over here or this happened over there. And so it can be helpful in that way. But then it can also be troublesome and detrimental in the way that you described where there's you know misinformation being distributed and people are arguing back and forth and it can almost become kind of like you know a, a cesspool type of experience. And so. Again, when you have, when you've been trained to understand and how to, um, and how to compartmentalize that, then you're able to go through into a group like that, get what you need, and and get out. Um, but other people who don't have that, you know, they could get sucked into that, and it's it's hard because you know nobody really has the authority to tell people what they can or can't say. In a, right. In a safe, I mean, moderators do, right? They'll say this violates what we, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, once it's said, it's said. And it can live in perpetuity because people can screenshot it. So even if a moderator takes down a post or blocks the person who put it or whatever, that doesn't mean that it isn't going to still live on. And unfortunately, there's no good way around that. There's just not. Yeah, other than, I suppose, a good relationship with a legitimate reporter. Exactly. Say, I'd like to give you the actual story and tell you what I can't tell you and what I can tell you and help clean this mess up. Exactly. And that's what we do where it's like, a lot of stories that we will find on social media or see on social media, when we reach out to the source, like we might reach out to the school district and say, hey, we've seen social media chatter about X, Y, and Z. What can you confirm or clear up? Because we want to put out a story that you know, clarifies what's really going on. And so that's what we often try to do with when we see discourse going on on social media and people are giving different accounts of what happened or what not and say, hey, we'll come in and we'll try to clear this up directly from the source. And that is why I closed my Facebook account. Yeah. You know. I was going to say, I think this is, uh, goes along with your example of technology moving faster than governments or mm -hmm. legislators can keep up with because it's like us, America, society determining what type of forum it is. Um, for instance, the library itself is a limited public forum, so it's not everybody's this is not a free speech square inside. Outside, we have a free speech square. So the, you know, courts recognize forums differently for the different levels of free speech. And I think that has yet to be done on social media platforms. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. yeah. And all that we've discussed, some people believe they can read it, they believe that they want to read, believe it, and all. I was just, I was just curious if you and your profession are seeing as citizens 
Because if you say now they're stamping on my free speech rights, now the readership goes up, right? Yeah. Now we've got like um, a dog fight. And so it's complicated. It is very complicated. And we are seeing that, which is why I wanted to spend so much time during this presentation on citizen journalism, because I think you know the rise of exactly what you're describing is really what we're seeing. And even earlier when I gave the example about um, X being blocked in Brazil, and there's the argument that, oh, well, this is um, censoring our free speech by you know closing this platform that we have. And then the other piece of, oh, well, we're protecting people from harm. Mm -hmm. um, we're, it's, yeah, <laughs> a Thank very you. difficult space. Thanks. You're very welcome, you're welcome. And then, um, okay, so the last thing, we have a couple minutes, and now I will say, um, I, I'm pretty much done with the presentation part, but there is a video with some social media do's and don'ts that kind of ties into what we've been talking about that I would like to share. I'll also be sharing it next week, but I just, I think that there'll be some people who might not make it next week or who are here today, and so I just wanna make sure that anybody who comes to this will, will see this, because I think it's really good and very helpful. Um, if you know you'll be here next week, you don't necessarily have to stay and watch it, but if there's a chance you might not be here next week, um, I would love for you to check it out. So I'll leave you with that. It's the very last slide. Uh, yeah, oh, I mean that, no, you're right, you're right, that video. Uh, so this is a newscast from a Wisconsin uh, publication. Today is the primary election in Wisconsin, and the general election in November is 84 days away. So as that gets closer, how can we all use social media responsibly and in a way that's healthy for us mentally? I'm joined by communications and digital strategist Krishanda Pratt today. Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. So to start off with, what are some of the social media do's and don'ts that people should remember during elections? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times we get so caught up in wanting to share our opinions, our thoughts, and our ideas, and there's just some couple of things that we really need to remember. Number one, I'll start with a couple of don'ts. Number one, everything you post is public, okay? So even if you have your settings on private, your posts can still be shared and made public by others through screenshots. So even if you're in a private chat or on a text message, Someone can still take a screenshot of what you said, and screenshots last forever, my friend. Another thing you want to make sure that you're doing is fact-checking everything. Misinformation can spread rapidly during elections. So make sure you're using fact-checking tools like WKOW.com to verify information before sharing, and making sure so those websites are thing. credible. I actually saw a site that was posing as a news organization, and they were using a Gmail account. Also, platforms make a lot of changes to their policies and they introduce new restrictions to curb this information. So make sure you're staying ahead of those changes so that way your content or post isn't rejected. And here's another thing. We want you to engage, but engage in a civil manner. Remember that heated debates can really damage relationships and your online reputation. Sometimes it's just not worth it. So sometimes it's best just to take a step back, take a deep breath, and really decide, is it worth me even posting this? Is it worth me even responding? And definitely some great reminders there for people. For some people, seeing political posts on social media can give them some anxiety, can build up some negative emotions. Is their only option to just get off social media for the next few months? So there are a couple of options. options. So yes, exposure to political content can be linked to anger and even anxiety. One of the things that I suggest everyone does, and I think people don't really know that they can do this, is curate your social media feed. You can mute people for 30 days, you can unfollow people, and you can even block certain accounts. But if you're still feeling a significant level of anxiety, I say take a break from social media for a few months and that can be a very valid strategy so that way you can preserve your mental health. You talked about this a little bit earlier in the interview, how everything you post online, you should assume it's public. How can mm -hmm. making a political post online affect someone's job? Yeah, it is possible to lose your job for making political posts, but that really largely depends on the type of employment that you have and the laws in your jurisdiction. Here's the thing, if your boss is following you, your fellow colleagues, you probably wanna be mindful of what you share. For some people, this is why they create a second account that's really more um, private and they're very um, intentional about the people who engage on that particular account. But you need to be mindful of what you're posting and how that lines up with the job that you have. Rashonda, what would your final takeaway 
do you want people to have about how they should, you know, effectively use social media during a time when there can be a lot of really high emotions in our country? I think one of the things that we have to take a step back is everybody wants to share their opinion, and that's the liberty that we have, right? We have to be mindful of I can share my opinion and I can win an argument and lose a person. And I think we would all agree that no argument is worth losing a relationship over. So think about that before you post. Some really great reminders here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, I will give you a